Welcome. Frankly, I'm getting sick and tired of internet trolls coming over to my channel and telling me I should be looking at Tony Heller's videos because he's the only one that's talking the truth about science. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a picture of Tony Heller being stumped by a question from the audience about what his real name is. It prompts the question, will the real Tony Heller stand up? Is he Tony Heller or is he Stephen Goddard? Or both of those pseudonyms and he's actually somebody else? We don't know. His resume is rather vague. He came to be all sorts of things like a geologist. I assume that's a bachelor's level degree. Just to let you know, at my college, uh, when I went to study astronomy and astrophysics at the undergraduate level, we took advanced physics and advanced math courses. And those that couldn't hack those two major subjects were shuffled off to the geology department where math and physics is not really that important. He claims to be an electrical engineer with a master's. Maybe that is in fact the case, uh, but generally people with master's degrees are ones that couldn't hack a PhD course. He claims to be a computer programmer. Who isn't these days? He claims to be a teacher, but is rather vague about what he taught to whom. God help his students. He also claims to be a climate expert, which I hope this video will show is an absolutely hilarious claim. A while ago, there was a series of video debates between Potholer and Heller. It was about the relative role of carbon dioxide in changing global temperatures. Potholer shows that Heller misquotes him in trying to undermine his position, appeals to papers that say the exact opposite of what Heller claims they do, or is mistaken or plain lies about various issues. In other words, Potholer wins the debate hands down in my opinion. There's also a video by Malin Baker that I can recommend to you on a similar line. In this one minute and 30 second video, Heller makes five fundamental scientific errors. This is what he said. Let's look at what's actually going on in those ice core graphs. We can see that there's a strong correlation between temperature in blue and CO2 levels in red. You will note that Tony Heller shows this graph and claims there's a strong correlation between carbon dioxide here shown in red and temperature here shown in blue. On the surface of it, it looks that way, but there's a trick here. Note that the dynamic range of the temperature graph is twice that of the carbon dioxide graph, sort of decoupling the two of them. So it's very hard to contrast the details. Indeed, the peaks seem to line up fairly well, but what about the rest of it? There's also this other thing which he didn't point to, which is interesting, is right on the far right hand side of that graph, there's a little red line that goes all the way up to about three degrees centigrade, which means that these are the modern temperatures that are equivalent to or greater than the peaks of the four previous interglacial periods. That will be important later. But this is not the standard plot. In fact, I had difficulty finding this plot. The most common version of this plot looks like this where they have the dynamic range of the two plots to be similar. And yes, the peaks of these interglacial periods and the peaks of carbon dioxide line up very, very well. But it's very hard to tell from here whether there's which one is leading and which one isn't. However, there are long periods of time when the correlation seems to break down. Here are just some of the examples. And interestingly enough, it's mostly on the decay phase of the interglacial period, when there seems to be an excess of carbon dioxide, even though the temperatures are dropping. Either temperature is tracking carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide is tracking temperature, but they always move in lockstep. Geologists like myself have understood this relationship for a very long time. The second trick he uses is to give us a false alternative. Either carbon dioxide is following temperature or temperature is following carbon dioxide as they move in lockstep. Well, we've just shown that they don't always move in lockstep. So what does that mean? A good scientist will ask other questions when you see an anomaly like this. Could they both be led by other factors? Is there a difference between the mechanism that changes from an ice age to an interglacial, which seems to be fairly well correlated, and the change back to an ice age? 
he of course he uses the 800 year delay between the carbon dioxide and the rise of temperatures to say that it's obviously that carbon dioxide is following temperature. That is a false conclusion. What does this delay imply? It implies to me more than one mechanism is at work. And we know what those mechanisms are. They are in the mainstream literature for years. And obviously he hasn't read them or just decided to ignore them. The first one, the one that initiates all of this, is Milankovitch cycles. But they are too small to explain the changes in temperature that we've seen. So there must be other factors that come into play. Another important factor is albedo changes. As the temperatures warm slightly from the Milankovitch cycles, snow cover and ice retreat, producing a lower albedo, which means that the Earth absorbs more energy, melting more ice and snow and increasing the temperatures. And of course, during the decay phase, there is the reverse effect, that the ice and snow advance, increasing the albedo. And lastly, it's the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. These all work in, on different timescales. However, they work in this order. First Milankovitch cycles, then albedo changes, and then greenhouse gas concentration changes. That explains both the lag at the beginning of an interglacial period and as we revert back to an ice age after an interglacial period. This is a phase diagram of the solubility of carbon dioxide in water. The thing I found most hilarious about this little section is that Heller doesn't know what a phase diagram is. He calls this solubility curve for carbon dioxide, which measures the solubility of carbon dioxide in water as a function of temperature. He calls it a phase diagram. It isn't. This is a phase diagram, as any high school student will tell you. It's a plot of temperature against pressure, showing the change of phase of a substance from solid to liquid to gas. And if you extended the axis off to the right a lot further, so the substance would dissociate and ionize, the fourth phase of matter, plasma, would come into play. So his solubility curve has got nothing to do with the phase diagram. We have water temperature increasing along the x-axis and solubility increasing along the y-axis. You can see that as temperature increases, the solubility goes down. There's always a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean. So as the temperature of the ocean increases, the amount of carbon dioxide it can hold decreases and it outgasses carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Thus, an increase in ocean temperature causes more CO2 to move into the atmosphere and vice versa. When the temperature of the ocean goes down, more carbon dioxide gets absorbed from the atmosphere and thus lowers levels in the atmosphere. So we can see this relationship in the graph. As the temperature of the ocean goes down, the solubility of CO2 increases. Thus, CO2 gets pulled out of the air and the atmospheric concentration decreases. And the exact opposite happens when ice ages end. The temperature of the water goes up very rapidly. This decreases the solubility of CO2 in the seawater and causes it to outgas into the air. Thus, atmospheric concentration increases. So the relationship here, as Potholer correctly stated, is that CO2 follows temperature. Temperature changes first, then the CO2 changes later. Then he makes his most fundamental scientific error of all of these. He claims that there's lots of carbon dioxide in the ocean. That is true. He claims that as temperature rises, the ocean can hold less carbon dioxide. That is also true. But he then claims that as these temperature rises, carbon dioxide outgasses from the oceans. That is not true, because that only happens if the oceans are saturated with carbon dioxide, and they are orders of magnitude less than saturated with carbon dioxide. The reason why a soda can bubbles like this is that under pressure, that liquid is got a supersaturated level of carbon dioxide. So when you release the pressure, the bubbles come to the surface. And when you drink this substance, because your mouth is warmer, it will make it outgas some more. But that's only in a saturated liquid. And the oceans are not saturated with carbon dioxide. So that effect will not occur. Do I have proof of this? Yes, I do. 
Again, a halfway decent scientist would know this already, but let's go through it step by step. We know that global temperatures are at a new high. I remember that picture I showed earlier with the peak being well above previous interglacial temperatures. Well, here it is again in more detail just for this interglacial. And you can see currently our global temperatures are higher than the peak of the climactic optimum about six or 7,000 years ago. So the oceans are now less able to absorb carbon dioxide because they're warmer. Yet we know that the ocean pH is falling. That means that the ocean is getting more acidic because they're absorbing more carbon dioxide than they're releasing. So therefore, even at these high temperatures that we have now, equivalent to anything we've had in the last 400,000 years, the oceans are still absorbing more carbon dioxide. So they're not saturated. Now, if what Heller was saying was true, then in the summer, all of our oceans should become fizzy like a, like a soda drink. We should see carbon dioxide bubbling automatically out of the oceans as the ocean temperatures go up. And we don't see that. The reason why is that the oceans are not saturated with carbon dioxide. So this is a, a trivial point that he should know, or maybe he does know, but doesn't want to talk about because he knows it undermines his position completely. There's also a much more subtle point at play here, which to understand you'd have had to have read a first year undergraduate physics textbook, which of course Tony doesn't seem to have done, is that there is not very much carbon dioxide available in the oceans to out gas. The layer where carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean and carbon dioxide released from the ocean is a very thin layer, it's literally millimeters thick. So compared with all the carbon in the oceans, that, that top thin crust is not very rich in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide. There's another point here that carbon dioxide, when it's dissolved in water, changes chemically, unlike things like oxygen. First thing it creates is carbonic acid, H2CO3. As the chemical reaction continues, it produces carbonate and bicarbonate ions. You require a lot of energy to break down the, either the carbonic acid, the, bi, the carbonate ions, or the bicarbonate ions to retrieve your carbon dioxide. So there's a great deal more uh, energy that has to go into uh, the oceans before you can retrieve all of that carbon dioxide. So let's review Heller's bad science. He calls the correlation between carbon dioxide and temperatures strong. However, it's not strong all the time. It's not consistently so. So he shouldn't be drawing conclusions based on that strong correlation, including the delay. He even plots the data dishonestly, de-emphasizing the carbon dioxide role and emphasizing the temperature's role by putting them on different scales. He assumes only a single cause for the changes in temperatures to disprove the role of carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide seems a far better candidate for doing the bulk of the heating when you include those other two factors, namely Milankovitch cycles and albedo changes. And the most amusing of all, he doesn't know what a phase diagram is. He wrongly claims that rising temperatures will cause the oceans to outgas. That will not happen. So I advise you not to listen to the nonsense that Tony Heller comes up with, and I've got lots of other examples that we could call on. And so just ignore what he says. And if you see anybody touting his particular nonsense, please post a link to this video. In the meantime, stay well, stay safe. And goodbye until next time.